right, we are live. Hey everyone, we're back uh, to the Stanford MOSIS seminar series for winter quarter. Uh, I am Karen. We have with us Dan, Fyodor, and our, uh, our guest for today, Song Han from MIT. Um, so today we're going to be talking about tiny ML and how to run ML on device with Song. And um, the plan, as always, is going to be a 30 minute talk by Song and then a 25 minute podcast discussion today because Song has to leave five minutes early at the end. Uh, where you, the live chat, can ask questions and we'll kind of keep track of those questions and get them across to Song uh, during the discussion phase. So just a little bit about Song. Song is an assistant professor at MIT in the ECS department. He got his PhD from Stanford and his work is pretty well known, uh, including his work on deep compression, which is widely featured in the news. And he's also received a couple of best papers at iClear and FPGA. Um, so we're very excited to have him talk to us today about um, how we can reduce the carbon footprint of machine learning. Song, you can start sharing screen and, and take it away. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Let me on your slide. All right, can you see my screen? Yep, yeah, it's good. Can you see? Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna dis uh, describe the work putting AI on it tiny ML and efficient deep learning. So deep learning is very computation hungry and very data hungry. For example, our meeting Li uh, took almost 2000 CPUs and three, uh, 200 CPUs, $3,000 electric bill per game. So this such a high computation uh, will clean the battery for an increased cost of ownership for cloud AI. On the other side, deep learning is very data hungry, require a lot of training to achieve a high quality. Uh, for example, the ImageNet data set has more than a million images that is very expensive to collect. So we hope to make deep learning more efficient, uh, reduce the computation complexity, also make it efficient. And this also helps our goal toward the green AI to make it more sustainable in the future. Um, below is the common carbon footprint benchmarked for like a round trip between New York and San Francisco is roughly 1,100 uh, pounds of CO2 equipment. Human life average one year is roughly 11,000 pounds. US car uh, roughly 126,000 pounds. But the transformer uh, with neural architecture search, uh, which increased the accuracy by a little bit compared with a human design transformer, this neural architecture search took 600,000 uh, 600, pounds of CO2 emission. So we are replacing human beings, but such AI designed AI model is very expensive to design and emit a lot of carbon. We hope to solve such issues to make them efficient and green. So let, let me first go through um, our existing techniques, deep compression to make it fast and efficiently with limited hardware resource. The basic idea is to design a smaller neural network, either by compression or designing a smaller one from scratch to make it a smaller and less memory intensive so that we can fit it on low power hardware devices. A method, a popular method is by pruning where we can save the computation and the memory by reducing those redundant connections and redundant neurons so that uh, the pruned model has a smaller amount of uh, memory and computation overhead. Like this original Resident 50, um, 100 megabytes of weights. So after a deep compression, um, it's compressed by 17 times. So it's only six megabytes, make it ready to fit in the SRAM. And pruning and, and sparsity is getting increased attention since 2015. This is the paper uh, per numbers, number of publications collected by NVIDIA. The number of publications searched very quickly. Um, the natural pruning as a keyword after 2015, uh, especially in the hardware community where many industry uh, products has adopted this technique to the uh, memory footprint for example, pruning and CD um, is now natively supported by NVIDIA A100 GPU. With um, this two to four sparsity, uh, we can have uh, uh, 
uh, NVIDIA is the GPU has 2x peak performance uh, since total velocity uh, for every two elements, uh, for every four elements, both of them are non-zero. So half of the weights are pruned and they are achieved uh, and achieved the 1.5x measured speed up uh, on the BERT, so which is quite significant. And on the left-hand side, some of the early publications from my PhD and from my group at MIT are related to uh, handling sparsity neural nets. And also uh, Dynix um, Vitus AI tool uh, natively supports the pruning and quantization technique. For example, deep compression takes the performance, uh, um, reduces the complexity by five or to 50 X after integrated into the Dynix Vitus AI tool. And the quantization tool is also available in the AI quantizer in uh, Vitus AI. So we want to um, push further beyond compressing an existing model, um, design an efficient model to begin with. To answer that question, uh, we first look at this, where we moved from cloud AI to mobile AI. Now we have a more ambitious target uh, to deep neural nets on tiny microcontrollers. Microcontroller is getting very popular uh, in the IoT, Internet of Things area, where all the devices are connected, getting smart uh, very, very widely in smart home, uh, autonomous driving, uh, smart retail, um, and also smart hospitals, healthcare, agriculture, smart many things, uh, et cetera, industry, et cetera. Um, these devices are super cheap, uh, just a couple of dollars, a couple of cents, but the resource is very limited, only uh, several bytes of flash and only bytes of flash to store the weights. So how to efficiently run reference and training on these devices? So we have um, three papers that I'm gonna describe today. Um, two categories, category one, optimize the computation efficiency, category two, optimize the data efficiency. Um, for data computation efficiency, uh, we'll first talk about inference, um, MCU net for efficient inference on IoT devices, and then training, how to achieve tiny on-device transfer learning. And next, I'm gonna talk about improving the data efficiency with differentiable augmentation for data efficient GAN training to train GAN only with 100 images. Okay, so that's the agenda for today. Let's first start with inference, uh, MCU net for IoT devices. Tiny deep learning on IoT devices. So this is the uh, resource comparison of cloud AI, uh, gigabytes of memory, terabytes of storage, mobile gigabytes of both memory and storage. But for tiny on um, those microcontrollers, the SRAM available is roughly uh, hundreds of kilobytes. And the storage, the total number of bits is in the order of less than one megabyte. So that's four orders of magnitude smaller than both cloud AI and even the AI where mobile phones have system has uh, virtual memory, but AI is pretty much just bare metal. There's no uh, operating system, no management, very challenging to uh, run these neural nets on these bare metal devices without the virtual memory, very limited memory resource. So we need to reduce the peak activation size as well as the model size to fit to this DNAs on microcontroller. For no efficient neural network design only reduce targets reducing the model size, but not the activation size. For example, uh, on this figure, there are two groups for parameters and then uh, for peak activation. From Resin 8 to Mobinet version 2, 0.75x, which both have 78% high image net accuracy, Mobinet V2 is uh, parameters very greatly, uh, 4.6 times. However, the peak activation didn't increase, uh, didn't decrease first because the, uh, the inverted bottleneck is not, uh, is not activation efficient. The inverted bottleneck caused a large uh, number of up to six times uh, than the unconvolution, which actually increased the peak activation, which make it very difficult for microcontroller. But this is not a problem for mobile phones since mobile phone has gigabytes of memory, but tiny 
microcontrollers has only hundreds of kilobytes of memory. So we need to change, fundamentally change the design methodology as not only parameters, but also the activations. So our budget is right here. <laughs> you see the huge gap between what we have and what we need. As a result, conventionally, people can only uh, classify those simple tasks like classifying orange and apples. But we want to uh, do this full image net classification. Therefore, we propose this MCU net to, sort of to deploy these neural nets on this challenging memory, given challenging memory resource, only 256 kilobytes of SRAM, one megabyte of flash on microcontrollers. The idea is to co-design the neural architecture, the compiler, and the inference engine, and compare TensorFlow Light Micro plus MobileNet version 2, the existing industry standard. Uh, we can save the memory by four times, speed up around three x, and achieve a much better accuracy from 53.8 top one image net accuracy to 70.7 more than 70 percent image net top one accuracy. And here the idea is to co-design the neural architecture and compiler and the runtime. So on the left hand side we have the tiny stand for tiny neural architecture. On the right hand side we have the tiny engine, the tiny inference engine. Existing work either design the, the NAS part or focus on the tuning the engine given an existing neural net. But and opening the large design space give us much uh, larger room um, to do um, more innovations. For example, uh, the speed up achieved by uh, tiny engine is roughly is from 1.5 to 3x uh, faster than existing um, libraries, including the Google's TensorFlow Lite Micro uh, and also Micro TBM tuned, uh, and also the ARM's well tuned low level library CMC's NN. Uh, for example, compared with the CMC's NN. Uh, after applying co-designing the um, scheduling policies with the neural network, including the code generation, uh, specialized image to column, operating, operation fusion, loop and tiling, which are all neural network architecture aware scheduling, uh, we can get um, more than uh, six faster than the wildized ARM CMC and the memory side uh, on the memory side, on these four benchmarks, one on sidebar on the left and three on ImageNet. Uh, especially on the ImageNet, the uh, memory saving ranges from 3x to 4.7x uh, x to 4.8 times compared with uh, the existing libraries on the uh, microcontrollers. Here uh, we have a slide showing the power of co-design. The base in blue, we have an accuracy of only 39 and this uh, STM32 F746 MCU. By placing ARM CMCs and then with a, our tiny engine uh, on the same microcontroller, we can fit a model at 49% accuracy. Well, CMCs, but replacing Google's mobile 2 with the tiny NAS, we can uh, accuracy to 56%. But replace both um, with tiny NAS and the tiny engine, uh, we can boost the accuracy top and accuracy to 60, 64, or 62 on ImageNet, which shows the effectiveness of uh, neural architecture and inference engine co-design. So now let's switch gear to talk about our tiny NAS. Uh, some bad, um, NAS stands for Neural Architecture Search that aims at replacing human design, machine design. So deep neural nets are not notoriously hard to tune the number of layers, number of channels, uh, the depths, the width, resolution, everything. So we want to have this automated design methodology use machine learning to design machine learning models. However, this used to be pretty expensive, can emit as much carbon as five cars in their lifetimes, very not affordable for academia, since we don't have those large amount of GPU resources. And we analyze the, the bottleneck for such high cost and figure out why it consumes so much computation. So conventional neural architecture search has two more four loops on the left hand side. You can see on the, uh, on the red part, in, uh, outside this four loop for training, uh, this 
forward and backward, there are two more for loops. One is for search in meta-controller, one is for differences. Um, so adding two for loops in the already very expensive for loop uh, make it very, uh, uh, very computational expensive. Our idea is to decouple training and the search. Okay, so we train only once. And then we can directly sample this super neural network. We call it once for all neural network, directly sample from over there and then test if it is a good model. Okay, so this just involve inference or even the just the latency predictor. Um, no training during the search process. Therefore, the search is very efficient. But the key idea of decoupled search, we can drastically reduce the amount of uh, training time neural architecture search. And to improve the quality, um, we adopted this idea where uh, human brain activates sparsely. Okay, so we train one large once for all network that contain many child networks that are sparsely activated like this animation shows. The child networks share the weights with the once for all network and they are trained jointly. During training time, we have a um, progressive shrinking uh, schedule where we start with the full net and progress shrink um, to get a smaller subnetworks. We sample a subnetwork uh, which share the weight and jointly train them. And in this way, we can sample a large network for GPU, middle network for mobile device and a tiny uh, subset for controllers. So no matter how many different devices that we have, we can have a one network feeding all. And even for the smaller networks, the methodology achieves better accuracy than training the smaller model from scratch due to the better super, super and also the stronger regularization since the sub network not only have to work well on itself, but also at a super together with neighbors. This is similar to the Russian doll where smaller child networks are nested in the larger ones. And in this smaller one can be trained better than, trained, than training individually from scratch. Another application scenario is say, when you get up 9 a.m. full battery, 2 p.m. half the battery, 9 p.m. most no, uh, running out of battery, battery. Um, enable the mobile app developer use different sub networks to cater for different uh, battery levels. Okay, so how is the performance? So the X axis is the latency on Samsung phone. The Y axis is the image net accuracy. Um, so we train different subnetworks. Uh, we can get a different net sub networks for free by training only once. You can see it's a very dense Prado curve. Train once, get many. Compared with the state of the art uh, industry uh, method, the mobile number in three has both higher accuracy and also lower latency in the trade-off curve. Here's a more comparison uh, for uh, compared with the efficient net on the left and the mobile net version three on the right hand side. For example, on Pixel one mobile phone, the um, uh, once for all network is 2.6 times faster than the efficient net. And with the uh, same latency, roughly 160 milliseconds, uh, the once for all network is up to 3.8 percent higher top one image net accuracy than uh, the efficient net. And the best model is already over 80 percent top one accuracy, uh, which is pretty uh, accurate in the mobile setting. So the advantage of such once for all network is that it can fit diverse hardware platforms by training just one single model. By selecting different sub-networks, we can fit Samsung phone, Google phone, LG phone, or a NVIDIA GPU, Intel CPU, or even specialized Zilinx FPGAs very easily. For example, on the Zilinx FPGA, we can reduce the latency from roughly 6.2 milliseconds, roughly four milliseconds, so 50% relaunch without changing these. And also, as we decouple the training and the search, the carbon uh, footprint 
for doing such neural architecture research is also greatly reduced. So that we can, uh, as academia, we can also afford it from 454,000 pounds to only 340 pounds. And the key idea is weight sharing and nesting small networks with larger networks. And remember the Russian doll, we just train one network and we can produce different sub networks for, um, for search. And everything uh, for the once for all network is open sourced on the GitHub. So you're yeah, welcome, welcome to check it out. And uh, this is showing, just showing the accuracy and the latency uh, and computation trade off. Um, on the left hand side, these are all auto ML neural architecture search models. And once for all network is pretty efficient. Uh, 594 million max, uh, low max and high accuracy more than 80% top point accuracy. Compared with Resident 50 is here, exception is here. All right, so we not only searched the neural architecture, the inference engine, so we co designed the hardware architecture. So, hardware architecture search together with the neural architecture search, opening up the design space in one loop. Here we have the quantized neural architecture in the search space, also the compiler and mapping and tiling in the search space and also the hardware architecture in the search space, including the array size, the SRAM size, the scheduling method, the data flow, et cetera. So we use the evolutionary method to do mutation and crossover for both the neural network population and also the hardware population. We select the best fit that has high accuracy and also low energy delay product. So we get this evolved accelerator and also the evolved mixed pre neural network. And after such evolving, um, both the compiling strategy, neural network architecture, and hardware architecture, we can step by step decrease the latency, uh, decrease the LDP by 1.47x, and then another 3x, and then another three, uh, four, two points, another 2.7 percent improve of accuracy by this gradually uh, incorporating the neural search, compiler, uh, compiling strategy search, and also the uh, hardware architecture search these three steps together. Okay, so back to the IoT applications. Uh, we targeted not only ImageNet, but also two popular weak words data sets on visual weak words and also Google speech command. Visual words just detect if there's person or no person. Speech command is just like, um, uh, okay, Google, hey, Alexa, those commands. And also we can handle diverse hardware platforms. For example, um, using the once for all network, we can efficiently handle a small microcontroller like STM32F412 all the way up to STM32H743 compared with the yellow, which is the baseline from Google. We can improve the accuracy by up to 17% of top one emission accuracy. On the weak words uh, data set, um, the MCU net um, can improve the uh, latency by up to 2.4 times faster compared with uh, the baseline method, including our competition result uh, in CVPR, which is in cyan, in the cyan color, and up to 3.0 times smaller. On the audio weak words data set, we can achieve up to two times smaller or up to 2% higher accuracy. Um, the most accurate, accurate one is almost 96% accuracy. So here we have a demo for the visual weak words data set running on the STM32 uh, microcontroller. So it can detect, uh, so it's STM32 F46 microcontroller, which um, this is the uh, development board, which also includes a screen. It has 320 kilobytes of SRAM, one megabyte of flash, Cortex M7 running at 200 megahertz. Actually, a pretty poor um, hardware resources. So the basic running the person detection, when a person passes by, it turns red. And there is no person is blue, uh, is green. Uh, the baseline mobile net plus TensorFlow Lite Micro runs 75% uh, top line accuracy um, with, let me pause here. 
uh, with 2.6 frame rate, 2.9 second. Well, the MCU net, including both the tiles and the tiny RAM has 87% top point accuracy at 7 uh, pre frame per second. We also applied our tiny ML techniques to autonomous driving, uh, in particular for LiDAR based. So LiDAR has been notoriously difficult to de deploy since they have sparsity. Uh, Minkonet runs five frames per second on the GPU. Up after our kernel optimization, it is 18 frames per second. Co-designed with our neural architecture search technique, it can run 40 frames per second. And finally, it can be deployed on real time on a car rather than only five frames per second. It cannot, it cannot drive a car. And this is in collaboration with the Nina Russ group deployed our model on a real uh, sized Toyota car. Also here's a demo for tiny ML for point cloud. Um, increasing the frame rate from 3.4 frames per second to 9.1 frames per second for this segmentation task. Here are some more demos for tiny ML for GANs, accelerating horse to zebra by GAN compression, increasing the speed, speed, speed from 12 frames per second to 40 frames per second on the Jason Xavier GPU. We also have tiny ML techniques for video recognition which is a very important workload for smart home auto, auto driving and also on the data center cloud. Yeah, since many hours of YouTube videos are uploaded every day. Uh, baseline F3D method runs 164 million seconds per video. Um, our technique make it a nine times faster, 17.4 milliseconds per video. And on data center, also people care about the throughput. So um, each row here is represents a video. So the faster the sweep, the faster the recognition. So baseline method, 6.1 videos per second after our acceleration is 77 videos per second with even better accuracy. Um, also, uh, here's another diver, uh, switch gear a little bit. We also did distribute training on these videos since video is the biggest big data. With 1,536 um, GPUs, we can save the training time from two days to only 14 minutes, almost a linear speed up, 256 versus 211, by designing more better uh, models that reduces data movement, including both the communication bandwidth and also the disk bandwidth. Data movement is expensive, can be cheap. And we can scale the batch size all the way to uh, 12K. And 1.6 to 2.9 higher training throughput compared with uh, camera video models. So now I finished the inference part. I'm not sure about this, if I can the uh, training, but I think it's pretty sustained stop here. Uh, if we need to stop stop sharply at one um, three thirty, um, no, so you if you if you would like to like walk us over some of the training parts as well. Okay, cool. So I can briefly walk through the training part. Um, the motivation is on device training, so that we don't need to send those private data to the cloud, which sacrifices the accuracy. But mobile device is very challenging training because training for um, a larger batch size and back propagation or those intermediate activations. So the memory footprint is much larger, orders of magnitude larger than inference. Well, conventional uh, reduces the number of trainable parameters, but doesn't necessarily reduce the activation size. For example, ResNet to MobileNet, the model parameters by 4x for the uh, activation for training doesn't, doesn't improve much, only 10%. Um, other methods like fine tuning only the last layer, it indeed save the trainable parameter, but, also, but it can lead to a large accuracy drop. Other methods, like only tuning N layers and also the last layer is very parameter efficient, 
but it is not memory efficient. The memory saving is very limited. So 12x parameter saving, but only 1.8 times um, being of the real training memory. And also the loss is quite significant. We propose the tiny TL stand for tiny transfer learning technique. And two ideas, fine tuning the bias only. Bias doesn't require storing the intermediate activation. And also plus the light residual learning where we can compensate for loss of accuracy by only fine tuning the bias. Uh, we can achieve both high accuracy, similar accuracy as the baseline fine tuning the full network, and also a large memory save roughly six times. So the key idea is during back propagation, um, we need to store those intermediate activations in order to uh, update the weights. However, if we don't update the weight, but only the, we don't need to store these intermediate activations at all, we can achieve 12 times smaller memory. However, imagine it induce, uh, reduces accuracy by up to 16%. So how do we compensate for the accuracy? So we create a light residual module. So added another branch compared with the baseline method. We add another branch called a light residual module, which can save for the loss of capacity. The light residual model has one sixth of the channel, half the resolution, two thirds of the depth, which has um, overhead of activation. Therefore, we can recover the accuracy, as you can see on the right side, but also keep the memory uh, pretty low on the left-hand side. Achieve roughly 4.6 times saving of training on the data set, cars data set, and also on the flowers and data set, the saving ranges from four to six times. We can also combine this with group normalization to enable batch one training. So with batch one training, we can have the same accuracy, but reduce the memory, total memory requirement, including everything to only 16 megabytes, which make it possible in cache training. So megabytes in the L3 cache, making it possible to do training all in the SRAM. So techniques like wafer level integration, if we have limited SRAM, now we can enable training also fully in SRAM. So I think it's a promise reduce, uh, that can reduce the uh, training memory. All right, so the goal is to enable uh, edge devices and also enable uh, low memory training. And the key uh, take home, we should reduce the trainable memory, not just the trainable parameters. Trainable parameter reduction doesn't lead to training memory reduction. All right, lastly, I'm gonna briefly cover the data efficiency. How do we reduce the amount of data requirement uh, for training uh, neural nets? And in particular, for data efficient GAN training. So uh, data is expensive. It takes months or even years to collect the data um, together with prohibitive annotation costs. For example, FFHQ is a popular uh, data set for uh, generating uh, photorealistic human faces collected by NVIDIA, 70,000 selected uh, post-process human faces and one million images on ImageNet. Um, if we have only limited amount of data rather than 70,000, what if we train the GAN with only 100 image? The quality becomes very poor. Like the cat on the second row, some of them doesn't even have the eyes and nose. So GANs heavily deteriorate given limited data, similar for the dogs. And quantitatively, um, we measured the FAD, uh, with which is <laughs> the lower the better, with 100% training data, 11.11, .11, but given only 10% training data, um, the quality is only uh, 36, uh, the FAD becomes 36. Um, and the reason is that the discriminator quickly overfits. 
Okay, so the training accuracy is very good, but the validation accuracy deteriorates very quickly. So the key idea is to be able to optimize, uh, to, to augment uh, both the real and the uh, fake uh, images. If we augment only real images, the uh, generated image will also have these artifacts. Um, if we augment the fake only, uh, it will cause unbalanced optimization, which cripples the training. Um, and our approach is to do differentiable augmentation for both fakes and real images. They need to be differentiable so that we can back propagate um, all the way to the generator, not only to the dis discriminator. And as a result, we can preserve the uh, FID even with only 10% of the training data. And here we have some comparisons before our method on the left and after again, again augmentation on the, on the right. With the diff augment, the quality is getting much better for uh, human faces, cats and dogs. You can see the eyes, the nose becoming more photorealistic. And compared with fine tuning, which requires tens of thousands of images, our data requirement is much smaller but the quality is, full, um, is on par with uh, those fine tuning methods, sometimes even lower FID compared with the first three methods. So here we have a hundred shot interpolation demo showing that our method is not just remembering the input training data set, but can generalize really well, for example, from spring to fall, from days to the night, and different angles of the faces and different size of the architecture. So you are welcome to check out the code, code and generate photorealistic images with only 100 training data. All right, let me conclude my talk today. Uh, today we presented tiny ML and efficient deep learning techniques. Uh, first, we discussed optimized computation efficiency from cloud to mobile to even uh, tiny devices. ResNet to MobileNet to MCUNet for microcontrollers. So MCUNet makes it possible to deploy image net level accuracy, deliver image net level accuracy on these tiny microcontrollers for IoT devices. And for training, we propose a tiny TL that fine tune the bias only and can save the training memory, not just the parameters. Finally, we presented improving the data efficiency by differentiable GAN augmentation to train photorealistic GANs with only 100 images. And finally, thank my students and collaborators. And for more information, you're welcome to check out our um, website, GitHub, and YouTube channel. And all the mentioned code is available on our GitHub. Thank you. Thanks, awesome. Thank you, uh, Song, for the great talk. And uh, I just want to remind folks in the audience that you can um, ask questions in the live chat. Um, so just to kick us off, I guess one thing that I was curious about was uh, you talked about how much gains you're, you're seeing on these devices, right? Like three to five times on things like uh, inference time or memory and, and so on. So I'm just wondering, like, uh, do you have a sense for how much headroom is left? Is it is it just like uh, the fact that things were so inefficient earlier and you've come in and kind of brought in like more customized um, architectures and more customized like inference engines uh, that, that things have sped up and, and how much more can we go from here? And are some of these lessons transferable to also just like a standard, you know, GPU uh, inference and training? And have you, have you thought about that as well? Yeah, so um, I think there's still plenty of headroom. Um, the more we do research, the more we find it's possible to do such thing. Previously, I cannot imagine doing anything with only one megabyte of storage. It's not one megabyte of flash, uh, not one megabyte of memory, but one megabyte of storage. That's the total amount of um, non-volatile resource that you have. Um, but the code design, we, we think, I think really opens up a large design space. And also the um, neural, neural architecture aware scheduling and also the scheduling aware neural architecture search, such co-design opens up a can design a fully matched neural net with the inference engine. 
Um, and also we save, also have to think about the size of the code. So with only such one megabyte of non-volatile storage, um, even the code size matters. So lots of optimizations. Um, for the second question, how to transfer these from microcontrollers to GPUs, um, I think it's always a matter of how much constraint do you have? So on GPUs, probably we have different design targets. We have plenty of memory. We have plenty of, um, a, a computation. I think the key is the throughput. That's a different design space, but I think a lot of ideas could be shared. For example, the co-design, um, uh, the neural architecture search, and some of the general uh, compiler optimizations can be transferred to those throughput oriented scenarios as well. Hey Song, uh, there's a strong argument, I think, that modern deep learning architectures like ComNets and Transformers um, have been as much influenced by the hardware available, like the GPUs and what, what you're, how you can train those things um, as kind of anything else. Uh, if you could kind of like go back in time um, and design uh, machine learning models or deep nets kind of for IoT from scratch, like if you could go back to like, um, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, uh, how would you kind of like redesign those architectures and uh, and uh, and change? Like, if you could wave a magic wand, what what would you think about changing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I didn't have time to cover everything, but we exactly asked ourselves the question initially. So, the story was, and let me tell you the story. We started with the mobile net version two, and try to fit it on the microcontroller. It doesn't fit. Therefore, our, we, the first approach is to scale it scale it by 25%. It can fit, but the accuracy is pretty low, like only 50%-ish top-end accuracy on ImageNet. And we find where is the bottleneck. We find the activation is highly non-uniform. Uh, so some of the layers becomes the bottleneck. For example, one layer um, hurts all the layers. Therefore, we have to globally scale uh, the layers. Um, but on mobile device or GPUs, that's not a problem. Like a mobile phone, our phone nowadays has gigabytes of memory, so it's not a issue. So we think about how to balance the activation size. Um, manually do that is very cumbersome. Therefore, we research on neural architecture search. However, <laughs> the conventional NAS method requires lots of computation. Uh, we don't have so much GPUs. So we go back, started with fundamental uh, NAS, NAS research. I proposed this once for all network last year. And after that, we come back with this magic tool, the once for all network. We find another problem. The inference engine is not efficient. Then we spend a lot of effort writing our own inference engine uh, that is neural architecture aware. Now we can finally put everything together and co-design the neural architecture with the inference engine and considering the memory, uh, the activation size as a major design target. Well, conventional methods mostly focus on reducing the number of trainable parameters. But we find on these resource constraint devices, uh, activation is a even more critical bottleneck. Yeah, that, that's really cool. I, I really like the, that kind of evolution of, of like, you know, you try to wave the magic wand and then you actually like go go through the steps of how you how you do this. Um, so speaking of kind of the that co-design process, uh, I really liked the idea that you talked about about decoupling training from search, which is kind of uh, like decoupling things is kind of like one of those things that you might hear about in sort of systems context. I wonder, do you think there are other uh, like expensive search or like expensive operations that could be decoupled in that way? Um, uh, it seems like. This sounds like it, it could be a really cool like general principle to take advantage of. Um, just wonder if you've thought about uh, applying it or you know set similar things in other contexts. Um, the couple training and the search is the key idea of saving the uh, carbon uh, the GPU hours and, uh, and training cost uh, when we are doing NAS. Um, I think it's because we are lazy. We want to spend the effort only once. Right, have a like a toolbox and like contains everything we wanna uh, use later. 
and they can just forget about training, just have this magic uh, once for all network. And when we need a larger one, we just pull a grab a larger sub network. We need a smaller one, we just grab a smaller uh, sub network without having to worrying about retraining. However, we initially tried this. It does provide decent accuracy, but it's not as good as training the model from scratch. As you can imagine, there's no free lunch. So later we want to make sure, okay, we have this once for all network. We want to have equally good model or even better model by selecting a sub network. Therefore, we, we used this technique called progressive shrinking, which I didn't have time to cover today to start with larger one, then smaller, then smaller, then even smaller. Given the intuition that we are optimizing a highly non-convex problem with convex optimization, therefore we think redundancy helps with convergence. So after applying such progressive shrinking, um, um, the, the, the subnetwork can actually have pretty good accuracy, even better accuracy compared with uh, directly training the same architecture from scratch. Therefore, it can be a a uh, fully working proxy for the original network. We can just grab the sub network from the once for network without retraining. And the other application, I think we can uh, generalize this to other vision applications, data sets, and also different hardware platforms. Like we already collaborated with many industry partners uh, to deploy this thing on CPU, GPU, and also FPGA accelerators. Um, to follow up on the um, once and for all network and the shrinking that you just described, there was both a question from the audience and one question from me that are kind of related to that. So the question from Shreya from the audience was, um, did you find that the performance improves or stays the same um, during the, the while tuning the sample networks? And my question is, um, this, um, you know, this seems to be, um, um, let's say, um, uh, an expression of the lottery ticket hypothesis. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, it basically states that there, there are sub, if you mask a network, there are sub networks within the network that can perform better than the original network after you're trained it. Do you have comments on this? Um, yeah, so uh, the thing for lottery ticket is that you have to train it in order to figure out which are useful. Right. Yeah, on Cypher, that's not necessary. On, on, on MNIST, that's not necessary. But on ImageNet, you at least have to train a couple of epochs in order to figure out which are important. Um, therefore, I think um, when I was at Stanford, I did a similar um, experiments. It's very difficult to find the trainable parameters in the beginning. Um, therefore, uh, the progressive shrinking also follow um, this idea where we start with the four full network and then gradually select a smaller and smaller sub sub network and therefore we find um, with progressive shrinking compared with uh, without progressive shrinking uh, this training schedule um, is pretty advantageous and I have some uh, numbers to show here so the yellow part is without progressive shrinking and um, the green part is with the progressive shrinking. The image net accuracy can differ by up to three, more than 3% top one image net accuracy difference. Got it, that's very interesting. Uh, I have a question about this kind of co-design approach that you've employed to really you know, explore that trade-off between accuracy and efficiency. Um, you know, it seems like for every kind of model or task, you have to go in and redesign the compiler or the inference engine to to try to kind of push uh, the limits of how efficient you can be while remaining accurate. I was wondering if you had any plans to try to, you know, automate some of this away, you know, some kind of reconfigurable compiler or inference engine that can kind of pick up on the task and reconfigure itself to let you automatically explore that trade-off. Yeah, we think that's very important and quite useful to have a push the button solution um, to have everything. We're almost there. We even have the hardware uh, configurations uh, learnable as we presented briefly. I have two slides for that. 
putting the hardware configurations uh, in the search loop mm, by evolution altogether. Yeah, that's very important um, direction. Song, so uh, a question from the audience and also a question I was asking. So Sandeep Kumar um, is wondering about the, the quantization to uh, int 8 and whether that degrades performance. Um, I was also thinking, uh, you talked a little bit about robustness um, in, in, your, uh, in your talk. And uh, one of the interesting things I think is that sometimes, you know, a smaller, you know, theoretically weaker model is actually able to uh, sometimes like generalize or be a bit more robust. So uh, I think, you know, we're, we're both wondering kind of how do you see the relationship between, you know, like making these models tiny and how that affects their robustness? Um, is it kind of like what you expect or do things kind of like happen in, in weird ways sometimes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, if you mention, uh, especially you mentioned quantization and robustness. So we started this a little while ago uh, in this paper called defensive quantization when efficiency meets robustness. So quantization is a very widely used technique to improve the efficiency, but what's the robustness impact? So we find um, intuitively um, this quantization make, should make it more robust because everything as long as the activation lies within the quantization bucket, if it doesn't escape the quantization bucket, it should, um, any noise within the bucket doesn't matter because after quantization, everything within the quantization bucket will be quantized to the centroid. However, we find this not necessarily the case. Um, errors will be amplified as deep, you go to deeper and deeper layers. So small error, large layer error, even larger error as you go from layer one to layer two to layer T. However, adding a simple trick to constrain the Lipschitz, um, to add this Lipschitz regularization um, to surprise this error amplification effect can effectively contain the error within the quantization bucket. Therefore, quantization can make it more robust against these adversarial attacks because any noise within the quantization bucket will be surprised to the quantization centroid. Hopefully that answers the question. That's, that's really cool, <laughs> I just wanna say. Uh, could you stop sharing your screen for a bit then? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I think there's another question about uh, the data efficiency um, aspects that you discussed on um, just like uh, doing some data augmentation and differentiable augmentation. So uh, one question is just around some of the uh, details around how you set up the differentiable problem there. But also in general, I think uh, just wondering, like uh, you talked a little bit about training GANs at, uh, at small like data uh, scales, like, uh, and you showed a little bit of the smooth interpolations that you, that you get. Um, do you also think that there's some trade-off there in terms of the, just the diversity of samples that you see? And, and in general, like uh, what kind of trade-offs have you seen with um, setting up like data augmentation type problems where you have a lot of like synthetic data um, and like when the amount of synthetic data kind of exceeds the amount of real data, which might be the case here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. We try to answer this question as well and provided as much as data um, examples in the um, um, in the uh, appendix of the paper. So I can share some of the visualizations since the audience are interested in diversity, which I think is a very important aspect of, of GANs. Um, the conclusion is that it's actually quite diverse. Uh, for example, there's the visualization of the nearest neighbors in the pixel space measured by the layer wise distance. Given a query image, okay, and we wanna find the top three nearest neighbors to see if they look alike. Actually, it's quite diverse. It's not just simply memorizing the training data. Um, so each query, is a generated image of our method without any pre-training on the 100 shot um, data set. So the nearest neighbor is an original image queried from the training data set. So we are not simply picking the training data set, uh, showing the effectiveness of the diversity. And here um, is some other queries um, for different phases. 
and also comparing the um, pre-trained with 70,000 images versus only 160 um, images. You can see with diff augment, the quality is much better without diff augment and can be pretty much similar um, as, as far as I can tell with these pre-trained models with 70,000 images versus only 100 image. Um, you are very welcome to try by collecting a data set of your own face. Actually, my student did that for me. Uh, the, the face generated faces look like myself, actually. And he generated similar images for many celebrities. And I am convinced by his technique. So welcome to check it out and generate, just input a hundred images with your own data set, use the code and see what you can get. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I wanna be mindful of the fact that you wanted us to, uh, you have another meeting at 12.55. So uh, I wanna thank you for, for coming in and giving your uh, talk. It was really interesting and definitely very different from the talks we've had before. And I also wanna thank the audience for tuning in. Um, please go to our website, mlsys.stanford.edu if you want to subscribe to our mailing list and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll have talks every week starting up again. Um, next week, we'll have Travis Sader from uh, Uber coming in. So uh, looking forward to that. Thanks, everyone. All right. Okay, thanks. Bye to the audience. <laughs> See you later.